Hello everyone, welcome to another IB Physics past paper review. This is May 2018, standard level paper one, and we're on page 12, which gives us question 22, 23, and 24. So here we are with question 22. Uh, we have an object um, with a mass, M, at the end of a string with the length R. Uh, it's moving in vertical circular motion at a constant angular speed, omega. So what is the tension on the string when the object is at the bottom of the circle? Well, we're in circular motion, so we're going to want to have a look, look at our, some of our forces for that. So here's our data sheet. Uh, let's put it up here. You can move it over, actually, because these are the ones we're interested in. So we've got our angular velocity here multiplied by the radius of the circle is going to give us the velocity in the circular motion. And then we've got our acceleration our centripetal acceleration which is the v squared over r and then a derivation of that and the same thing for our centripetal force uh, we're just having this mass multiplied by the acceleration here and then we can just simplify that down and get our mass omega squared r okay um we're going to come back to this at some point but let's go ahead and do what we should always do in a dynamic situation we should analyze the forces so let's do a little sketch of the diagram. Uh, it's, here's the center of the circle. Actually, let's move it over here a bit. Center of the circle here. We have an object with a mass right here. And it's going to be going, obviously, around in a circle, vertical circle, at a constant speed. And here we are. So first up, um, assuming we're on planet Earth, obviously, we're going to have an, a force of gravity. Now, if we imagine this being stationary, Okay, if this is stationary for a second, then there's going to be a force going upwards. It's going to be this here, and that would be the force of tension. Okay, but in addition to that, hopefully you can just imagine if you're spinning something around in a circle, you're going to increase the force on this string. So that's where we, we talk about having this centripetal force coming into play. This is our centripetal force here. And so when we start analyzing for our F net expression, remember it's the sum of all forces. So we're gonna have lots of different forces here. Well, in because we're talking about a net force, this net force can end up becoming our M uh, centripetal acceleration, this one here. So the mass of the object multiplied, this, multiplied by the centripetal acceleration is gonna give us the net force acting on it. And so we can just even go down further and say that this is the, the force centripetal. So what then we, then we have to look at what's happening. Well, let's go ahead and say that up is positive and down is negative. So here we have a positive centripetal force. And so the other positive force is going to be the force of tension. Oops, wrong color. So force of tension. And now I'm going to have to add on my negative force, which is going to be the force of gravity. That's the only one going down. Um, so maybe actually we'll do that like this. We'll say, we'll say that this is Ft plus the negative Fg. And that way, this time we can say that it's just going to be negative. So Ft minus Fg. Okay, so now let's have a look at what we know. We know the mass, we know the radius of the circle, and we know the angular velocity, omega. So bringing that over to our, our, uh, our data sheet here, hopefully you're zooming in on this guy here. So there's mass, so we've got mass, check, angular velocity, check, radius of the circle, check. That matches up with the, the, the question. So now we and so now we're going to start thinking about what we know. Okay, so we know we're going to know the centripetal uh, force, which is going to be a product of the mass, omega squared, and the radius. We, we we know that we can get that. We also know the force of gravity because obviously that's just going to be mg. And then the question is asking for the force of tension. So what we're trying to find out here is the tension in the string. Okay, so there we go. We've got th we've we've correctly analyzed our forces. 
both schematically and with our FNet algebra. We know two of these things, we're going to find the third. So we know the force centripetal, we know the force of gravity, we're going to solve for the... So we're going to get our Ft over here, and then it's going to be Fc plus Fg. In other words, Ft is equal to... Uh, oops, uh, that's m omega squared r plus mg. Now at this point we need to factorize. We've got an m and an m over here, so we're going to factorize and, and get our omega squared rg into brackets, basically. So we're going to just do that by uh, taking our m out, and then we're going to go m times omega squared r, which is the same as saying this here plus now we need the same as mass times g well the mass is already out here so mass times g is just going to be g so there it is omega squared r plus g factorized that gives us our simplified algebra and then hopefully you can see that the answer must be a Okay, so question 23, a little bit of a qualitative question regarding Newton's law of gravitation. So I'm referring to, I assume we're referring to um, our force of gravity being equal to g m1 m2 over r squared. And remember that this is true for uh, three-dimensional sort of inverse square law situation. If, so if you have a mass here and you need to know, and you can, let's say you have another mass over here, then there's going to be a radius between them, center to center. There's going to be a mass here and a mass here. And we can work out the force that each of these would experience, uh, which would be the same in both directions because it's equal and opposite and such. So that's what we're referring to here. Now, is this equivalent to Newton's second law of motion? Uh, Newton's second law of motion, of course, being F equals MA. Well, hopefully you can see, no, it's not going to be equivalent at all, is it? Because, um, well, essentially the second law was a simplified version and it works for us. The reason we use it for, on planet Earth is because we're treating it like a uniform field. If this is us stood on the surface of Earth, then we are an object nearby us will experience this uniform force. And that's because we're sort of treating the surface of the Earth as not being curved. We're treating it as being flat. And so it's almost like being between parallel plates with our Coulomb's law. It's for all intents and purposes, it's basically a uniform field. Although if you zoomed out, so if I was to, if you were to, if you were to zoom out and out and out and out and out, make this smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, then of course, eventually you'd have to stop using this. You wouldn't be able to use this anymore because you'd have to treat it like an inverse square um, gravitational law. So I'm going to go ahead and say that it is not, it's not this. Okay, B, does it explain the origin of gravitation? Does Newton's, oops, not that one. We just said it's not that one. I'm talking about this one. Does this one explain the origins of gravitation? Does it tell us what gravity is? Well, Quite famously, Newton said no. He actually didn't even try and explain what gravity was. He just found that these were relationships between objects and they could be used to, you've guessed it, yep, to make predictions. So he didn't even attempt to try and explain what gravity was. We had to wait for Einstein to come along and give us some sort of geometric curved space explanation, uh, which was general relativity. So we can go ahead here and say that it's it's not this one either. And um, I've already mentioned predictions, so I think we've, we've kind of given it away. But just to eliminate D, um, Newton's law is not true, not valid in a vacuum. Well, of course, that's ridiculous because we still use, I say we, scientists, astrophysicists, astronauts, NASA, uh, SpaceX, Elon Musk, all of those guys, they're going to use this formula to make very good predictions of um, traveling into space. And of course, space is pretty much as close as you'll get to a vacuum. 
So if this didn't work in space, if it didn't work in a vacuum, then we wouldn't have made it into space and our, our calculations wouldn't work. So it's not going to be that one either, is it? Which means, yes, you guessed it, it's predictions. That's what this formula is good at, making predictions. In fact, even nowadays, when we know all about Einstein's theory of general relativity, those calculations are ridiculously complicated. So it's much easier for us just to use this one here. It's a good approximation of what happens. So it's used to make predictions. Okay, so question 24, we have some Feynman diagrams going on and we need to show which one is representing a beta plus decay. Uh, so just to remind us, it might be worth uh, having this handy, although I'm not going to keep it on the screen because I need some space to just write out my thoughts. Um, but of course, we need to know that we have baryonic numbers associated with, um, with quarks and antiquarks. We need to know lepton numbers and charge numbers for all of these different types of things. So keep that handy and I'll just talk through what we need to know as we go through. Okay, so we have, um, we have a beta positive or beta plus decay. So I'm just going to shrink this a little bit and think about what, uh, what, what possible ways we can get a beta positive decay. And hopefully you can see just even from here, um, we've got an up decaying in, in answer A, same in answer B, same in answer C. So the only one that doesn't have an up decaying to a down is our answer D. So hopefully you can recall just from your course that normal uh, or a common way to get a beta positive, so this is our, represent, we're representing our decay here, I'm going to put my beta positive right here, a common way to get this is for a proton, that would be a positive proton, to decay into a neutral neutron. Okay, so you get a neutron plus a beta positive particle. Okay, so let's break up what a, a proton consists of, and then we'll start thinking about the, um, we're gonna start thinking about conservation of charge. We're gonna think about conservation of, actually it's a different color, oops. Conservation of baryonic number, and conservation of lepton number. So we need to make sure whenever we do a, a, a Feynman diagram, we're keeping track of all of these three things. So what is a proton made of? Well, a proton is made of an up, an up, and a down. Okay, so an up, and up, and a down is going to produce a neutron, which is an up, a down, and a down, plus our beta positive, and possibly, some of you probably guessed it already, possibly something else. And that will become clear when we look at our, our conservation laws. Okay, so let's take care of our baryonic numbers first of all. So we've got a, I'm going to be using, uh, going to be using these as we go through and keeping track of our baryonic numbers. Okay, um, so first of all, our baryonic number is going to be a third times the number of quarks, so put the number of quarks, minus the number of antiquarks, okay? So we can represent that in our, uh, let's just do a break point. In our example, our, in our question here, first of all, where are the quarks? Well, the quarks are in here, up, up, downs, and up, down, downs, but not here. Remember that a, a, a beta particle is not a quark. So we can represent our, uh, let's go, a third multiplied by the number of quarks. Well, on the left side of our equation, we have three quarks. And how many antiquarks? None. Okay, so we have basically one, a baryonic number of one. I'll just put that underneath. Baryonic count of one. So conservation of baryonic number means that over here we should also have a one. Okay, so how many how many do we have? Well, we have one third, and then of course we still have our three quarks, and so there we go. So we're happy with our baryonic numbers. Okay, so baryonic numbers tick. We can say that we're happy with that. We've checked our baryonic numbers. We have 
three baryonic, uh, we have, sorry, we have three quarks on one side and three quarks on the other. Happy days. Let's do charge. So I'll use a red pen here for charge. Well, um, underneath each one of these, we can say that an up quark is two thirds of the elementary charge plus another up quark, two thirds of the elementary charge. Now, a down quark is a negative one third. So now it's going to be minus one third. Okay, so let's count that up. Two plus two plus one, uh, two plus two minus one is three. Three over three is one. So our charge is one elementary charge. Okay, now we should have, we should have the same on the other side. So let's do that down here one elementary charge, and over this side we should also have one elementary charge. Um, and that should also be a positive, positive, one elementary charge. Okay, so let's add up everything on the left, on the right side of this equation, where we have an up quark, which is a positive two-thirds, now we have a down quark, so minus a one-third, and then, oops, let's make that a bit neater, minus one-third, and then another minus one third gives us zero. Okay, well that's obvious because we're dealing with a neutron. A neutron has a zero charge. So we need to somehow conserve our charge. And just by looking at the, the quarks, we haven't done that. Well, yep, you guessed it. There, you can see that the, the charge is conserved by the positron. Oh, sorry, the, the beta positive particle. So we're going to put that in. So it's zero plus the one elementary charge which comes from the beta positive particle. So again, have we conserved charge? Well, yes, we have. We've got one on one side, one on the other. That's good. Okay, let's look at the lepton numbers. And the lepton numbers might give us a clue as to what... Oops, didn't want to do that. They might give us a clue as to what is potentially missing over here. Um, oh, before we do that, actually, let's look at our, our Feynman diagrams. And we can probably start to eliminate a few of these. Um, so we've said that we have an up, up, down, converting to an up, down, down. So clearly what's happening here is that one of the up quarks is converting to a down quark. So we're going to eliminate this guy right away because this Feynman diagram had a down quark converted to an up quark. And that's not what's happening here. So this one's out of the question. These other ones, so far, we can't eliminate because they all have an up going to a down, up going to a down, up going to a down, and they all have a, uh, a beta plus or a beta positive in here. So really what we're interested in is what's additional. In other words, this neutrino or anti-neutrino that's coming in here. Okay, let's have a look at our lepton numbers and maybe that will give us some insight. Okay, so how many, let's just keep this here. Let's take our neutron here, like that. And then our beta there. Okay, so how many leptons are on the left side of our equation? Well, none, no leptons here. How many leptons are there in our neutron? Well, none. How many leptons are there in our beta positive? Well, remember, a beta positive is actually an anti-electron. So this is, this is going to be a negative lepton number. So there's a negative one here in terms of our lepton numbers. So we're going to have zero here. We need to have zero over here. Okay. But we also have this going to put it in as a negative one. So we're adding a negative one. So we must also have a positive value. So what's missing needs to be a positive lepton number. And what's a positive lepton number? Well, that's going to be uh, not antimatter. So look at this. This one here is anti. This one here is anti. So it cannot be these two. What I'm saying is that this additional thing 
must be, oops, that's not a very good neutrino sign. What it must be is a, a, a real neutrino, not an anti-neutrino, an actual neutrino. So there it is. That's going to give us our plus one. And that means it has to be, it has to be, it has to be this guy here. It's got to be A. And just to finish it off, of course, I forgot to put this positive one in here. So I've kept track of my baryonic numbers. I've kept track of my um, charge. I've kept track of my lepton numbers. All of those must be conserved. That's kind of where Feynman diagrams come in. You've got to keep track of those charges. The other thing to think about would in this one, which we didn't talk about, would be the, the W bosons in here. Now, the... Uh, the char the, the, this is where charge has to be conserved. So as an intermediate piece of this equation, we could have put the, the W boson in here. And since we started with a positive, well, the positive can't change to a negative. So it would have to be a positive to match the charge all the way through. So that would also mean that we could eliminate, we could have eliminated this one based on the charge of the, the W boson. And the other reason we could have eliminated B, well, just convention, the way we draw our, our um, uh, the way we draw our antimatter, antimatter tends to go, in Feynman diagrams, tends to go the opposite way to normal matter. So you can see that this um, beta positive here is coming into, and so it's going the opposite way, and that's how we normally represent antimatter in a Feynman diagram. So this would be the correct annotation whereas this would not be.